Hey everyone, thanks for checking out part 3 of the Wii Retrospective. This time we're going from 2010 all the way up to the last game that was released physically in North America. If you haven't seen my other videos, uh, the Retrospective series, I kind of just go through my collection. Uh, I go through the full list of all the Wii games and pick out the ones that I think are worth mentioning. And it's just a way to kind of give everyone an idea of what games are worth checking out for this machine. So before we get started with 2010, I just want to mention one game that I forgot from 2009 in the last video, which is The Conduit. It's a first-person shooter developed by High Voltage Software, and it's really interesting because they built a whole new engine for it uh, so that games on the Wii could compete with some of the FPS experiences you were getting on the PS3 and the 360. It was called the Quantum 3 engine, and it looked really good for the Wii. Uh, it had a bunch of graphical features that you don't see in other Wii games. It had a full story mode of nine missions uh, all about an alien invasion. It had 13 different multiplayer modes which you could play online, so it was you know, quite a surprising package for the console. Also before we get into 2010, I want to go over two other games that I had forgot about in a previous episode. First up is Ultimate Shooting Collection, which was released on February 3rd, 2009. Now despite the game's terrible name and box art, this is actually a pretty cool collection of three different Japanese shoot-em-ups. The first one is Chaos Field, which you might know if you had a GameCube because it was released on that. And that's definitely the best of the collection. The other two are Keros and Redology. And altogether, those three games make up a pretty good Japanese shoot 'em up collection, so it's worth checking out. The next I had never even heard of, it's Excitebox Trick Racing. And this is a follow-up to Excite Truck, which is also a follow-up to the Excite Bike games. And it takes that racing formula and adds in a couple interesting things. First off, instead of your standard vehicles, the game uses these robot vehicles which are designed like animals and during races there are mini games of you know bowling, soccer, or pie throwing. It's really weird for a racing game but that's also what kind of makes it charming. Getting right into 2010, let's kick it off with No More Heroes 2, a uh, sequel to one of my favorite Wii games and also a really good sequel. They changed quite a bit about this one. They uh, removed the open world so now you just fast travel around using a map. Uh, the side jobs have been simplified, so instead of some of the annoying uh, side jobs they had in the first game, now everything plays out as these little 8-bit mini-games, so it's a little easier to earn money. The game stars Travis Touchdown again, who comes back, uh, you know, after being gone for a while at the end of the last game. He's been bumped down to rank 50 and uh, decides to compete all over, so he has to go through 50 ranks this time, although it takes about as long as the first game. There's a new playable character too, I won't spoil who that is, but it's a really cool character. Um, and overall, it's a great sequel to the first game, so I highly recommend it. Right after that, we have Tatsunoku vs. Capcom All-Stars. Now this is a game with a bit of a history that's really interesting. It's one of the Capcom vs. series games, so it it's follows games like Marvel vs. Capcom and X-Men vs. Street Fighter. Uh, you know, you could also consider SNK vs. Capcom, but that's a really different beast than these. And these are games that people had wanted more of for quite a while. You know, the Marvel license had gone to Activision, and so it seemed impossible that Marvel vs. Capcom 3 would ever be made. And, you know, we had heard about the first Capcom vs. Tatsunoku game, which came out for Wii in Japan, but Tatsunoku is completely unknown over here. I mean, you may know some of their anime characters if you watched anime in the 80s especially, but for the most part, no one here knew what that name meant. And so... And so the characters that are in this game, they're licensed all over to all kinds of different American anime companies. So it seemed impossible that Capcom would be able to get this out over here. But, you know, the, when the second one came out, which is this one, the All-Stars version, Capcom put in the legwork and they went and they got all those licenses sorted out and it managed to come out over here. And it's a, a great game. Uh, there's over 25 fighters. To work better on the Wii, the gameplay was simplified to use only three buttons. Uh, they had an arcade stick that came out alongside it. You could grab that, which was a decent arcade stick and actually really great for virtual console games and it kind of pioneered the 2.5d style that we saw later used in games like marvel vs capcom where you know everything's character models but it still plays like a 2d marvel vs capcom so it's a great game it's really fun it's the anime characters are weird and kooky uh i highly recommend it a couple other games i don't have anymore first is uh shirin the Wanderer. Technically, this is uh, Sharon the Wanderer 3, The Sleeping Princess, and the Karuki Mansion, or something along those lines. Um, if you're into roguelikes, then you probably know Sharon. If you don't, it's a mystery dungeon series from Japan. It's a roguelike game, so it's a kind of game where you play through different dungeons, and when you die, you lose everything. You have to start all over. There's very little uh, that you can keep when you die. 
it's an interesting roguelike because there's an interesting story in it and it's not just crawling through the same dungeons uh, there's kind of a progression to it so you move on to different areas sometimes you might be in a forest sometimes you might be in a cave but you're constantly moving forward in the game and there's uh, rest areas so there's towns you can stop in and other places that you know there may not necessarily be combat so it's really interesting for that. It's people who like roguelikes really dig Sheeran. You know, obviously it's going to be tough like any roguelike, but it's definitely worth checking out for those fans. Next up is another game I got rid of a while ago and kind of regretting it because I think it's pretty rare now, which is the Data East Arcade Classics title. This thing had 15 different arcade games by Data East. In some pretty notable arcade games, there was a lot of good stuff on there like Burger Time, um, the original Bad Dudes uh, vs. Dragon Ninja arcade game, uh, Bump and Jump, Caveman Ninja, which you might know as Joe and Mac. It had Peter Pepper's Ice Cream Factory, which a lot of people don't know is actually the sequel to Burger Time. And there's other things. There's Heavy Barrel, there's Lock and Chase, Magical Drop 3, Too Crude. You know, like I said, there's 15 arcade games here that really weren't released anywhere else. So if you're into arcade collections, I dig arcade collections on consoles because it's a great way to experience that stuff. Uh, this is definitely one worth keeping your eye out for. Next up is Endless Ocean Blue World. In the last video, I talked about uh, Endless Ocean. Um, and, you know, I've been trying to trim down my collection a bit to the games I think I'm going to play again in the future. And so I kind of figured I only need one Endless Ocean game. And this is the better game. Uh, the graphics are improved. The areas are bigger. You can sell the treasure that you find now and, you know, upgrade your equipment. It's just a little more of the adventure side. Um, it's still that kind of scuba diving, slow life game. So it's, it's nice and relaxing if you want to call it that it's a cool little you know scuba diving simulation game that there's nothing really else out like it so uh, if you're into slower games and just kind of you know taking it easy this is definitely a game that you probably want to check out uh, you'll notice i mentioned pretty much every survival horror game that comes out for any system when i do these retrospectives except for maybe like escape from bug island like that lower tier stuff um, or anything cross-platform because that's not really what these videos are for uh, so now I have to mention Hudson Soft's The Calling. It's an interesting adventure horror game where, you know, the players have gone to this website and they end up in this world called the Mnemonic Abyss, which is created from all the memories of dead people. And, you know, the characters that end up here have different reasons for trying to get here or end up here by mistake. Um, and you as the player basically travel through these haunted areas and you can see the memories of the souls that are there and fight off the ghosts that attack you. And it's just, it's a, you know, it's a decent little horror game. Um, you know, I think it's rare now, so it's probably hard to come across. But it's, you know, if you're into horror games, especially weird Japanese ones, then this is probably one that you should check out. Right after that, we have a Sam and Max Season 2 Beyond Time and Space. I talked about this Sam and Max Season 1 in the last episode. This was kind of the beginning of Telltale. Uh, they got the license for Sam and Max. They did that first season. They did this one. This is I got five episodes in it. Some of the characters from the first season return. There's some new characters. Again, it's really most notable because it's the only way to get this uh, physically for a console. And after this, there's a third season, The Devil's Playhouse, but that never came out uh, physically. So these are cool. If you're a really big Sam and Max fan, it's nice to have these discs. Finally. The big redemption story that no one really cared about, uh, Red Steel 2. It's sad because Red Steel 1 was a launch title I talked about. It was supposed to be a huge thing and then everyone ended up playing it and it was just kind of meh. Um, Red Steel 2, I, I'm almost surprised they use the same name because it has nothing to do with Red Steel 1 other than it's an FPS where you can shoot and use swords. It feels way more like a Borderlands game, like just the, the style of it. It takes place in like a desert town. It's got a little bit of a western feel to it. Um, it uses the Wii Motion Plus and it works really well. So finally, you get that one-to-one -one sword play. The Everything about it feels great. It's, it's a game that criminally people didn't check out because at this time the Wii was kind of on the outs and, uh, you know, I don't think people expected great games to still be coming out for it. But as a hardcore gamer who wants an action title, this is the one that you should have checked out. Right after that, we got the console version of Monster Hunter Try. Now, Monster Hunter Try was about the time when that series was starting to pick up steam in North America. I don't think it's the first console release we've got over here for that series. I think there were some on PS2, but at that time it was unknown and no one really cared. 
but with the series blowing up in Japan and starting to pick up a little bit of steam here, it was cool to have this thing on console. Um, you know, the Monster Hunter series is something that you primarily should play online or with other people, and the console just made that a little easier. One really interesting thing to note was it would be around this time that the new Pro Controller launched for the Wii. So I didn't show it, but in the when the system launched, the Pro Controller that came with it was really strangely shaped. Um, there were no handholds on it. There was It had nothing, like no smooth curves, anything really to help hold that thing, but it was essential for a lot of games. Um, the new Pro Controller was really designed to feel more like a real controller. It had handles kind of like, you know, a GameCube controller would have. Uh, it had the triggers up top were easier to get to. It just was a way better controller, and it's surprising it took this long to come out, but it was bundled with Monster Hunter Try. Right after that is actually my most recent pickup, which is Prince of Persia The Forgotten Sands. Now, I'm a huge Prince of Persia fan. I, I think it's kind of sad that Assassin's Creed killed off the series, even though I love Assassin's Creed. But, you know, at the time, people didn't care about this game at all because it was kind of on the outs. You know, at first, everyone hated the Prince of Persia reboot that was kind of a little more open-worldly. Uh, but then they grew to love it, and then when this game was announced alongside the movie, no one wanted this anymore. No one wanted a new kind of Sands of Time. Everyone wanted everyone wanted a sequel to that reboot game, so I don't think a lot of people played this. Or if they did play it, they played the... Um, PS3 and Xbox 360 version, which is a great game in its own right. And so, uh, like everyone else, I completely ignored the Wii version, thinking it's just a toned-down version, but it's not. It's a whole different game. And uh, the PSP version is completely different as well. So three different versions of a game with the exact same name. It's kind of funny, because when the Wii launched, there was a Prince of Persia game that launched with it. I think it was Rival Swords, it was called. And it was basically just Prince of Persia, The Two Thrones, but had a different name. So I bought that thing and got burned thinking it was a new Prince of Persia game. I should have done my research, that's my bad. But I feel like this is payback for Ubisoft. How do you have the same game with two names when you launch the system and then later on you use the same name for three different games? Come on. Anyway, <laughs> I'm rambling on. Um, it's a cool game. It, it's, it, it's completely different from the other game. All the powers are different. This time, uh, a genie leads the prince to this kind of abandoned kingdom that's been cursed. He has to, you know, break the curse and free the princess because he wants to take over that kingdom. There's a lot of waggle in it. You can create hooks and other things to help you get around the environment a little better. It's just a cool separate game from the other Forgotten Sands and worth checking out if you're a Prince of Persia fan. All right. I feel like I'm saying this too often, but another one of my favorite games on the Wii trauma team it's the follow-up to all the other trauma center games uh this time they take it in a different direction so yes there's still your typical surgery but there's multiple types of surgery and there's more adventure style modes so so there's six different characters and they're all doing their own storylines but they all come together when they have to fight this rosalina virus uh there's the main doctor who does the surgeries like the previous games there's a orthopedic doctor who resets bones and, and drills plates into bones and does things like that. There's an endoscopy doctor who, you know, uses a camera to go into the body and, you know, kill tumors and do things with tools that she can use from her camera. There's a diagnostician who, is, you know, uses a computer to help him uh, diagnose different conditions. And there's a forensic analyst who explores crime scenes and tries to figure out, you know, different things from the scenes that's really you know more of the adventure style of gameplay uh, and all of these come together to make a really cool game um, there's some characters from the old games that return there's new characters there's a really interesting storyline and the different kinds of gameplay really make it interesting uh, so i highly recommend you check it out super mario galaxy 2 i think Everyone agrees one of the best games on the system, if not the best game on the system. It takes everything Mario Galaxy 1 did and just does that again, but better. Um, it's harder. There, You can ride Yoshi now. There's a couple new power-ups. There's a Spin Drill power-up. There's a Rock Mario. There's a Cloud Mario. And now the game uses this kind of map like Super Mario 3 or Super Mario World instead of you know having you go around a hub world to access levels. Uh, the story is exactly what you'd expect. Bowser comes, he kidnaps Peach again, he takes her into outer space, so you got to get all the stars again and save her. There's not really much to say about it other than it plays really well. It's one of the best Mario games ever made, so check it out. Next up is Secret Files Tunguska, which is 
an interesting point and click adventure at a time when the point and click genre was dying over here there were some european developers that were keeping it going and this is one of the games that came out that was notable from then and it was just cool to have another point and click adventure i mean the wii is practically built for that so uh it was nice to get a port of that even if it was years after the original came out on pc the game has the player controlling a character named nina who goes searching for her father who's disappeared recently uh, she finds out that he was researching the cause of the Tunguska disaster that happened in 1908. It was a huge explosion uh, and she just tries to find him and figure out what happened there. So it's your typical point and click adventure but still if you're really into that genre anything is nice at this point. Next up Sin and Punishment Star Successor. Uh, it's a sequel to an N64 game that we never got over here. Treasure developed it. Uh, it's a cult classic arcade game and the Wii version has become a cult classic Wii game. Uh, again, I don't know how many people really played it. I didn't hear many people talking about it, but it is a really good hardcore action game. The story takes place years after the first game. You play the son of the f characters from the first game and there's an intricate story about him and this girl who were enemies, but now they've teamed up and they're, they're running away from the bad guys that are trying to take them down. Um... I won't really get into it because it is a little bit convoluted, but all you need to know is the gameplay is amazing. It's kind of like an on-rail shooter, but not really. You can dodge around the screen, you can fly, you can run on the ground. You aim in different directions that you're moving, and you can slash things that are close to you and deflect projectiles that come towards you. Just like you'd expect from Treasure, it's a crazy action game. It's really difficult, but rewarding. Uh, it's definitely something worth checking out if you haven't. Right after that, we have Ivy the Kiwi, uh, which is a game that I haven't played, but I've heard good things about it. It's designed by Yugi Naka, who was the lead programmer on the first three Sonic games and has worked on a ton of great Sega games. Um, it kind of takes its cue from Kirby's Canvas Course. So there's this character, Ivy, who's always moving forward, and you draw vines uh, to kind of guide him through the level. I've heard good things about it. I love Kirby's Canvas Course, so I'm sure this is a great game, too. Next up... Metroid Other M. Um, Metroid Other M is a game that was developed by Team Ninja. They kind of designed it as the spiritual successor to uh, Super Metroid, but uh, they tried to bring that Super Metroid formula into 3D in a completely different way than uh, Retro Studios did with Metroid Prime. So it's still, they try to keep that feel of a 2D Metroid game, but put it in a 3D space. It's really hard to describe. But I feel like it works really well. Um, I really do enjoy this game. I know it takes a lot of flack. But I think that what they did was really good in mo for the most part. But I do think that there are flaws that do ruin the game. The first thing is obviously Samus's characterization. Uh, there's a lot of dialogue in this game. There's a lot of talking about her past when she was working for the Federation. Or when she was training with the Federation. And some of the characters that she met uh, back then that are in this game now and it's just her characterization is so off and the dialogue is really bad and you know for a game that's all about atmosphere and more about showing instead of telling this game talks way too much um other than that you know now you can hold the Wii mode at the screen to go into first person mode and that's how you shoot your missiles and jumping back and forth between the third person and first person mode is really annoying so that those are the two complaints I have everything else about the game I think is really well done if you didn't play it or if you only gave it a little bit of a chance try it out again because the second half is actually incredible a couple other games to burn through here that I don't have in my pile first is the Gunblade in New York and Los Angeles Machine Guns Arcade Hits Pack uh, this was as a port of the two arcade games by Sega. Uh, they're light gun shooters, but they're interesting because instead of using your typical pistols or whatever, you had these big massive machine guns attached to the arcade cabinets and you know you were in helicopters, so you were shooting from helicopters basically. Uh, they're fun. They're really cool. They don't hold up quite as well on the Wii, but I feel like it's notable because otherwise there's be really difficult to play these games now and they're decent shooters. So uh, if you love arcade shooters, this is something that I think you would dig. Right after that is a real strange one, and it's called Wii Party. And it's basically Mario Party without the Mario. They said they designed it so that you could be, you could use your Miis and you could feel more connected to the game. 
I don't know if that's necessarily true. I think it was, if I had to guess, I would say it was mostly designed to sell to people who don't want a Mario game, to sell to those casual people who are just playing Wii Sports and Wii Fit. Now here's a family board game you can play uh, that's, you know, not intimidating. It's basically Mario Party, but it's not Mario. It was developed by ND Cube, who made the last Mario Party game, and it follows basically the same formula. You move around a board, you play different kinds of mini games with uh, the other players, uh, that's, there's really not too much else to say about it. Right after that, we have Kirby's Epic Yarn, which is uh, a really cool Kirby game. Uh, you know, the yarn thing now, it's been done twice. Uh, and this was a, just an amazing concept that looks so great. Um, you play Kirby, who's sent to this patch world, and now he's all made out of yarn, so he doesn't suck in enemies anymore. Instead, he uses his yarn to do different things. He can transform himself into things like UFOs and cars to, you know, giant robots to get around. Um, he can use his, his like, yarn lasso to um, wrap up or unravel enemies, to pull strings that are in the stage, and that reorients the environment in a way that lets him get through it better. Um, it's just It's just a great-looking game. If anything, my only complaint is it's way too easy, but it is, it is a style over substance. It is an incredible looking game, and it's something that uh, I think you should check out. The next one I have to mention is the Dragon's Lair Trilogy. Uh, so just like the Mad Dog game I talked about last episode, this is a combination of the three Dragon's Lair. Um, this is a combination of the Dragon's Lair Laserdisc games, so the... Uh, if you don't know those, you should look them up. They're they're historic. They're not fun to play anymore, but they were really incredible for the time. Uh, so this one comes with the three you would expect. It comes with Dragon's Lair, Dragon's Lair 2 Time Warp, and uh, Space Ace. Right after that, another game that shipped with the new Pro Controller, GoldenEye 007. Um, this is a game that let a lot of people down. It's notable for the way Nintendo hyped it. You know, they announced it at E3. It was a big deal. They were like, hey, look, GoldenEye's coming back. Everyone wanted GoldenEye to come back, but because Microsoft owns Rare and because Bond is owned by MGM, no one thought it could happen. And Nintendo made it sound like it was going to happen, but then the game we got is nothing like the original GoldenEye. It, it doesn't feel like the original GoldenEye. The levels are don't resemble the old levels at all. It's just something that I couldn't get into, and uh, I think it let a lot of people down because I haven't heard anyone talk about it since. Next up, we got Poke Park, Pikachu's Adventure. Um, you know, every Pokemon game is notable. This was an interesting spin-off with Pikachu going to this Pokemon theme park. You know, and when he gets there, he finds out that this crystal that protects the park has been shattered, and he's got to go and find the 14 pieces throughout the park. So it's kind of an adventure game. There's battling and mini games and objectives that you have to complete in order to get the crystal shards. Uh, but you know, it's mostly about exploring the park and completing the objectives. Right after that, we have Sonic Colors, which I think is really notable because it's a universally good Sonic game. I think people really like Sonic Colors. You know, the Black Knight and um, Secret Rings. Some people dug them, some people didn't. But Sonic Colors was a game that... But Sonic Colors was a game that people finally thought, like, great, this is a good Sonic game. It's completely different from the DS version which came out, but that's also a great game. You know, the game has Dr. Eggman starting at an amusement park in space and pretending he's turned over a new leaf, but Sonic and Tails go to figure out what's up and find out he's enslaved this alien race. It switches from 3D gameplay to the traditional side-scrolling gameplay. There's these Sonic simulator stages where you control a robot Sonic and get the Chaos Emeralds that way. For Sonic fans, I think it's probably one of the high points of the series. Right after that, Retro Studios, fresh off the Metroid Prime, uh, makes this Donkey Kong Country returns and you know obviously it's a follow-up to the Donkey Kong Country games that were on the SNES it's really good it captures everything about the old game but everything is better you know the, the graphic style of the old game is dated so poorly the new style used here looks really good it's bright it's colorful uh, the controls feel really good you can still play two players with one person controlling Diddy Kong you know, the story is your typical, you know, this new race appears on the island and steals Donkey Kong bananas. So he goes out and tries to get them all back. Um, it's just a great platformer. Uh, it's fun to play with a friend. I highly recommend it. 
Next was a game that everyone was kind of looking forward to, and I think it fell a bit flat, but there's a lot of history I don't know about it, uh, so that's worth looking up if uh, you're really interested. And this is Warren Spector's Epic Mickey. The game is notable for a lot of reasons, but mostly for kind of the, the theme of the game, where Mickey goes to this cartoon wasteland, which is this world that's designed like a Disney theme park, but it's made up of all these forgotten Disney things. So all these rides that no longer exist and, and references to different Disney things from the past. I think this game can be credited for bringing back Oswald, which, you know, was Disney's big character before Mickey, but no one remembered him anymore. Uh, so it was great to see him come back, and now he's back in kind of the Disney canon. The game had some really interesting gameplay mechanics, too. As Mickey, you had this magic paintbrush that you could use to paint the environment or to destroy the environment. And there was a little bit of a morality system tied to that. So, you know, the game changed depending on how much you were fixing this the, the world or destroying it. Uh... Other than that, it was a pretty basic platformer. It, it didn't feel that well, and the level design for me was a bit off, but just for the theme of it and for the historical importance of it, it's definitely notable. Next up is Super Mario All-Stars, the 25th anniversary edition. This game, they released it for pretty cheap. I think it was like 30 bucks Canadian when it came out. Uh, it sold out really quickly and then shot up in value because it was really hard to find. Um, the packaging is really nice. Uh, again, just like what you'd expect. It comes with, let's see. Nope. The game comes with this extra case, which includes uh, a 32 page art book and a CD that has 20 different Mario tracks on it. The art book has a couple interesting things, like there's a timeline, there's a page for every one of the main games in the Mario series, and the designers who work on them each say uh, a quick sentence about it. This is a nice little art book, and the art book is probably the only part of the package I find really interesting. The game is actually pretty lame because it is just an emulated version of the Super Nintendo ROM. That's it, it's just the four games. You know, this disc probably is, takes up two megs for all I know. Um, they didn't even bother to put in the cart that has both All-Stars and Super Mario World. If you've never played Super Mario All-Stars, uh, it's probably worth checking out because it's really interesting that they took all those original NES Mario games and made them into 16-bit games. They don't feel quite as well, but it's just cool to see. Uh, it's the first time that Super Mario Bros. 2, the real Japanese Super Mario Bros. 2, was released over here. It's a decent package, but I just wish they had tried a little harder on what they put on the disc. All right, now it's time for the 2011 titles. At this point, I think we're past the high point of the Wii. There's still some great titles this year, but this is where the decline really starts to happen. Uh, so kicking things off first, we get The Conduit 2. Uh, you know, I mentioned The Conduit at the beginning of this episode. It's, again, a first-person shooter that was just designed to look and run great on the Wii. This one has a new campaign mode. The levels are more open. Uh, you can customize your loadouts. You can flip over objects for cover, and you can use vehicles. Uh, it also brings back the multiplayer mode. This time you can do four-player split-screen and you can go online. If you were into hardcore first-person shooters and you didn't have any of the other systems, this was probably a game you really wanted. Another one of my favorite titles, and one that not many people talked about, uh, Lost in Shadows is a really neat 2D platformer by Hudson Soft. Um, the premise of the game is you're this boy whose shadow has been removed from his body and you have to explore this mysterious tower because you're a shadow, you move through the shadow world. So while you can see the real structure of the tower, you only move along the shadows that are in the environment. So it, it's a bit tricky at first to get your head around it, but once you do, it, it's really neat. You have this uh, sylph creature that follows you around that you can use to interact with the real world. So sometimes you can raise or lower gates or you know just mess with the light so that you can create a path moving forward when there is none. Um, you know, the goal is to get to the top of the tower. There's a bit of backtracking at the end, which is a little annoying, but other than that, I think it's, it's a great game. At certain points, you can enter the real world temporarily and move through the 3D environment, uh, but you can't stay there for too long, and it really just helps you get through areas that you can't do in the 2D world. Right after that, we're going to talk about Mario Sports Mix, which is such a weird thing because, first of all, it was developed by Square Enix, and secondly, it's a Mario sports game that doesn't focus on one sport. Uh, you know, so in the past we've seen Mario Tennis and Mario Golf and Mario Basketball. Uh, but in this one, it's a collection of volleyball, hockey, 
dodgeball, and basketball. Uh, so it's weird to see basketball back when there have been other Mario basketball games, but I guess they couldn't make full games based on those sports. So I guess it's a neat way to get some of that stuff out there without having to put all the resources into building full games for it. Right after that, we have The Blob 2. Um, I'm really including this one because The Blob 1 was a really notable Wii release back in the day, but uh, this one, you know, it's better, but it was also released on every other platform. Um, there's a couple new features to it, but nothing really notable. Next up, the second console version of Rune Factory. Maybe, I don't know if this came out after Rune Factory 3, I guess so, so it's probably the fifth Rune Factory game overall. In my last video, I talked about the other Rune Factory game. It, again, this is a fantasy version of Harvest Moon. It still has farming and stuff, but uh, there's more of an emphasis on dungeon crawling and fighting monsters. There's still an emphasis on managing your relationships and getting married. Uh, what makes this one really interesting is instead of taking place on one landmass, it's you're going between a bunch of islands. You have this kind of creature that you ride between islands. Uh, this is the first Rune Factory game that lets you play as a female, so people who play those Harvest Moon games tend to like. And it was also released on PS3 with move support. Another interesting title is We Play Motion. So this is a follow-up to We Play, which I would have mentioned in the first video. If you'll remember, We Play came out as a kind of collection of 12 or 15 mini games. The reason it sold so well back then was because it shipped with an extra Wii Mote, which were impossible to buy separately at the time. Uh, and I guess that was the thinking behind this one too, because this one ships with the new Wii Motion Plus Wii Motes. So we talked about it in the last video. The Wii Motion Plus came out and it attached to the bottom of the Wii Mote, and it allowed for way better controls and movement, but it also extended the length of the Wii Mote a fair bit. Uh, now they've built it into the Wiimote, so these new Wiimotes that were coming out around this point had that built into the standard size Wiimote, so there was no additional uh, length to it, and it had all the features that adding that would have had. The game itself had 12 new mini games, and they were tuned to work with the new Wii Motion Plus, so again, it's just another kind of series of tech demos for the controller. Kirby Return to Dreamland. It's the next game we're going to talk about. And it's a game that I didn't get to play until recently, actually, because I feel like I'm drowning in Kirby games. There's a new one out, you know, between the portables and the consoles, there's always a new one out. And uh, it's a shame because it maybe is one of my favorite Kirby games. It's the first kind of traditional Kirby game since the N64. It goes right back to that formula. So you're Kirby, you're sucking at bad guys, you're copying their abilities and using them to fight through the levels. This one has four player co-op, so the other players can play Meta Knight, King DDD, Waddle Dee. They all have different abilities. Um, there are these super abilities you can get where Kirby goes giant and, and has these really like, you know, Megazord version of his abilities, if you want to call him that, that he can use temporarily. And he's got a super inhale that he can use to suck up really big objects or enemies to help get through the levels. This game is crazy fun. It's wicked multiplayer. I highly recommend it. Next up is Mario and Sonic at the London 2012 Olympic Games. So the third Mario and Sonic Olympic Games game. Uh, I think the series was selling really well, so they just kept it going. Uh, this one goes back to the summer games of the first game. Uh, there's a lot of those games have been improved and brought over. Uh, there's also new games, including horseback riding, soccer, badminton. The Wii version has a new party mode that, you know, makes it quick and easy to play with friends. The 3DS version had a story mode, but that wasn't included in the Wii, so there's a bit of a loss there. Next up is The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword, a game that people waited for a long time for on the Wii, uh, and we're really looking forward to, and I don't think it quite lived up to the expectations, but it's a cool Zelda game in its own right. Uh, this is a special edition which came out which was really hard to get. Uh, I actually had the original edition pre-ordered, but I was in New York at the time and stopped by the Nintendo store, and even though the special edition was sold out everywhere, the Nintendo store in New York had a ton of them, so I picked one up. The special edition comes with a soundtrack, the game, and most importantly, the gold Wiimote, which actually looks really silly with the big silicone cover on it. <laughs> but, uh, you know, this game's still worth quite a bit, and the collector's edition is also still worth a fair amount. The other thing that is really interesting about this is around the same time, Club Nintendo released a gold nunchuck to go along with the Wiimote. 
Um, and this thing is really rare. Club Nintendo, I think it was like 800 points or something, which, you know, at the time, Club Nintendo was doing a thing where you could redeem the points that you got in games for different rewards. And uh, sometimes they had really cool rewards like this one. So uh, altogether, this is a pretty neat package. The game itself is all right. I don't. I think it was maybe a bit samey as previous Zelda games, but they tried to do something different. It looks great. Uh, it controls great with the Wii Motion Plus now. It requires the Wii Motion Plus, and your sword attacks reflect that. So there are enemies that you can only hit if you do vertical slashes or horizontal slashes. You know, the way you attack is uh, more refined than Twilight Princess for sure. Uh, you know, that waggle from that is gone. The game takes place at the earliest part of the Zelda timeline. So this is before Hyrule was founded. Uh, Link and Zelda, they live up in the sky and they fly a bird down to the surface to visit different areas of the surface. So in the game, surprise, Zelda gets kidnapped. She gets taken down to the surface and Link goes down to save her. Uh, other than that, it follows your traditional Zelda formula. Uh, so, you know, if you love Zelda, then you dug it. If you were looking for something new, uh, you didn't like it that much. All right, next up is Fortune Street, which is a game uh, that I don't think many people played or know about. Uh, again, we've talked about Wii Party and all the Mario Party games that came out, so it's strange to have another party game, but this one I think is notable because the series has been running for a long time in Japan, as Itadake Street, and it started in Dragon Quest III, um, and it was such a fun thing that they took that mini game out and, and blew it up to its own series. So it usually stars Dragon Quest characters. Sometimes they mix with other characters. One of the ones we have here that we want to do as part of our show is the Final Fantasy crossover. This one is a Mario crossover. So there's Mario and Dragon Quest characters and it's a board game style game. Um, unlike Mario Party, it's not about collecting stars or anything. It's all about money. So it's a weird mix of Mario Party and Monopoly, where the goal is just to kind of make more money than anyone else. Uh, so you buy properties and stuff like that. You know, it's an interesting virtual stock market board game. The last game I want to mention for 2011 is a bit of a strange one, but it's the Oregon Trail, which uh, if you were a kid with an Apple II in your classroom at school, you know the Oregon Trail. It's an educational game that came out uh, for lots of computers back in the day. You know, being one of the few games you could play at school, everyone in that time in North America knows it. It's a simulation game that was brutally hard. You traveled down the Oregon Trail and tried to stay alive, tried not to get dysentery. I don't know if it's worth playing or anything, but I just feel like it's really interesting because I think it's the only console version of the series. At this point, the Wii is really declining. We're still getting some great games, but they're coming out at a much slower pace. So we're going to burn through uh, the rest of the years right now. Kicking off 2012, we have Rhythm Heaven Fever. Uh, there were two previous Rhythm Heaven games for the portable systems. It's a series of mini games that are all rhythm based, so it's not necessarily it's so it's not a rhythm game in the traditional sense of you know match the beat along with a song. Instead, it's keep the rhythm to do this objective. There were a number of sets in the game that you played that each had a certain amount of mini games to them. There were over fifty mini games total, and there was also an endless mode. Right after that, we get the follow up to Poke Park, uh, Poke Park 2 Wonders Beyond. So, in this game, Pikachu and his friends go to a new Poke Park, the Wish Park, and they end up getting trapped there. Uh, so, you know, you gotta explore the park and complete different objectives to find your way out. <laughs> the game also had four player multiplayer modes. Oh, next up is Mario Party 9. So, I guess I made a mistake before when I said that Wii Party was developed by Andy Cube, who had been making Mario Party games. I was wrong because this is the first Mario Party game they made. And this game is notable because Hudson Soft, who had been developing the Mario Party games till now, uh, had just been shut down. So Nintendo brought on ND Cube, which was made up by some of the previous members of the Mario Party team from Hudson. Uh, and they developed this new Mario Party game, which is a bit of a departure from previous games. So for the first time, all players traveled in a vehicle along the board together. So instead of each player rolling the dice and individually moving their character, they moved everyone at the same time. Um, and that really sped up the gameplay. There's a huge emphasis on mini games in this one. Different mini games happen depending on where you land on the board. So, so this new gameplay dynamic was really interesting. It switched things up a bit. There were new bosses and mid bosses for each board. Um, you know, a lot of people didn't play this one because I feel like they were tired of Mario Party at the time. But this is probably one that was worth checking out. Finally, we get to Xenoblade Chronicles. I'm actually amazed this came out so late. Uh, there's a real sordid history here. Xenoblade Chronicles was a game 
that was developed in Japan by the creator of Xenogears and uh, Xenosaga. People were looking forward to a good RPG for the Wii for a long time. This is the one that really appealed to hardcore RPG players, but Nintendo of America refused to bring it out over here. Uh, it had a European release, uh, so I actually ended up importing the European version and playing that. I hacked my Wii just to play that. Um, and it was years later before Nintendo finally gave in. But, uh, you know, the fans started this this campaign called Operation Rainfall, where they wanted this and two other RPGs to be brought over. And Nintendo just refused to do it for years. They kept just saying, no, we're not bringing it out. I don't know why the translation was already done over in Europe. Uh, but yeah, just a slap in the face to Nintendo fans who wanted great games. But, you know, eventually they did bring it over. They still say Operation Rainfall had nothing to do with it which is, I don't know, maybe that's true. Maybe they are just being assholes. Um, anyway, the game um, is a huge open-world game. It's got MMO-style combat, which I don't really know what to call, but I think enough games do it now that we need a term for it. The game takes place in a really unique setting. Uh, the world is set upon the kind of body of this giant god who is locked in battle with another god, but they've been frozen for a long time. Um, and since then, you know, humanity has sprung up on their bodies and on the body of the opposing god, this Mechon race has struck up. So in this game, the two sides are at war. The Mechon come and attack the humans. They get beat back once, but now they're attacking again and they attack Shulk's colony. So Shulk, the main character, he gets control of this blade called the Monado, which is the only thing that can hurt some of the tougher Mechon. And he goes on an adventure with his friends up through the body to try and figure out, like, you know, what's going on with this world? How do we beat these Mechon? It's a really interesting, huge open world RPG that, you know, was worth the wait. Next up, still in 2012, uh, Pikmin 2 New Play Control came out. So I'm just mentioning it because it's Pikmin 2. It's an amazing game. Uh, just like the last game, they added new Wii mode controls, but there's nothing really else new to it. The second game from that Operation Rainfall, which I just mentioned, is The Last Story. This is a game that was designed by um, Final Fantasy creator Sakaguchi. It is a departure from his uh, Final Fantasy games and Lost Odyssey, which was his last game, which was very Final Fantasy-ish. Uh, this one is its a really neat evolution of the RPG. The combat is tough to describe. It's real-time combat. You play one character named Zale who has unique powers. He can kind of take focus from enemies. So he's kind of the tank. He has some magic abilities and he can ask his teammates to do certain things. And every fight in the game is less of a numbers battle and more of a uh, puzzle. It's really like you're in a room, you're in the situation or you're fighting this bad guy. What do you have to do to beat that bad guy in what order? And it's always unique and different. Uh, the game is a tight 20-hour kind of RPG, which is great. Uh, I love these nice shorter RPG experiences that don't have a lot of grinding. Uh, the story is really cool about uh, Zale and his mercenary group, and he wants to be a knight, and he meets the princess, and he gets a chance to be the knight, but they're at war with his beast race, and it's just... It's a real interesting story. It's a cool game. Uh, it's definitely worth checking out if you're an RPG fan. So, where I gave crap to Super Mario All-Stars for being a lame kind of here's an emulated uh, one cartridge emulated on disc Kirby's dream collection for the Kirby's 20th anniversary is exactly what we should be getting for these collections this game is incredible it is such a nice set it really celebrates the series um, you know this thing comes with a great collection art book it's got a ton of great stuff from all the games in the series it comes with a CD soundtrack, just like the Mario game does. But this thing has got a ton on here. There's uh, Kirby's Dream Land 1 and 2 for the Game Boy. There's Kirby's Adventure for the NES. There's Kirby Superstar and Kirby's Dream Land 3 for the Super Nintendo. And there's Kirby 64, the Crystal Shards. So all of those games, which are really tough to get a hold of. And even if you were to buy the virtual console versions that are out for some of them, that adds up to quite a bit. So it's a great collection 
And they didn't stop there. They added a bunch of extras to it, too. So they added challenge stages that are based on Kirby Return to Dreamland. Uh, there's a cool museum that you can go into and see all of the kind of promotional materials for some of the games. And it even has three episodes of the Kirby Right Back At You anime that had aired on Fox. I have a lot of these collection discs, and this is by far my favorite. All right, I guess it's time to talk about this thing. Very end of 2012... Nintendo gives us the Wii Mini. Uh, it launched, I think, only in Canada first. So it was available here exclusively for quite a while. Uh, it came to other... I think it came to North America quite a bit later, maybe a year or two later. The thing was designed for people who didn't have a Wii yet. It, um, you know, they removed a bunch of features to make it cheaper to produce. You could buy it new for 99 bucks Canadian, which is a big deal. Um, but it removed a ton of stuff. So it came with a red Wii Motion Plus Wiimote and Nunchuck. Um, they removed kind of the way the disk drive worked. Now it's just a pop top that you drop the disk in. Uh, all of the GameCube stuff is gone. You cannot use a GameCube games on here. There's no memory card slots or controller slots. There's no Wi-Fi, so you can't connect to the internet and download anything. No virtual console games, no WiiWare games. All of that stuff I feel is for forgivable. Um, I like the idea of a tighter, smaller, well, it's not really smaller, but I like the idea of a cheaper, tighter Wii. Uh, the unforgivable thing that they did is that they removed component support. The only output this thing supports is composite, which is garbage. The Wii is already a bad enough looking system. Um, you know, component gives it a bump that makes it at least manageable to play and not look like complete trash. Um... The composite signal is terrible looking. This thing could have had HDMI in it at the time. I don't know why they went for the lowest common denominator. I don't know why they didn't stick with the multi out that lets them do composite and component. Then at least, you know, it's on par with the regular Wii. But, you know, the way it stands, this thing is not really worth hooking up at all anymore. So with that rant out of the way, let's get to what I consider the last must-play game for the system. Pandora's Tower. This is also the third game from Operation Rainfall. It wasn't as well known as Xenoblade or Last Story, so I was surprised by it. But it's a really cool kind of action RPG. The game stars this character named Aaron, who runs away from his country with his girlfriend Elena because she's been infected by this curse, she's turning into a beast, and you know their people are hunting her and trying to kill her. So they get found by this mysterious Mavda who helps them get to this forbidden place which is where these 13 towers from olden times stand and uh, she's part of a race that is guardians of these towers and she tells Aaron that in order to save Elena he has to fight the beasts at the top of the towers bring back their meat so that Elena can eat it and that'll cure her and so it's it's got these interesting mechanic of exploring these 13 towers one at a time and bringing back meat to keep Elena from turning into a beast. So there's kind of a timer aspect to it. You have to keep going back to keep her from changing. Uh, you can manage your relationship with her by giving her gifts and talking to her, and that affects the ending. It's your traditional action RPG, but they give you this really interesting chain weapon that adds a lot of mechanics to the game. Uh, you can use it to kind of bind enemies, so you can wail on them when they're trapped. You can use it to kind of pull enemies towards you or, or, or you know, pull them apart. It's... Um, it adds a lot of strategy to the game and it makes the combat a little more interesting than your standard uh, action RPG. If you're a big RPG fan, if you like niche Japanese RPGs, this is one you should definitely check out. And that's the end of 2012. And, uh, but surprisingly, not the end of this video because there are still years of stuff. Thankfully, there's only about one or two games per year. So let me dive right into that. In 2013, nothing notable. Uh, I mean, I'm sure there were some games released then, but I don't have anything worth mentioning on my list. So we're going to jump right ahead to 2015, where in September, Skylander Superchargers comes out. Now, this is Superchargers was the game that lost me in the Skylanders universe. Um, the focus on vehicles, now needing to buy vehicles for every character, uh, it just added too much to the game. But at least the Wii version is a completely different game from the other console ports. So the Wii version is actually the same as the 3DS version this time, and it's got a lot more focusing on racing and less on adventuring. But again, if you were buying these figures, it's great to have another console version that you can use them all on. 
The following month, we get Just Dance 2016. And, I mean, we've had Just Dance games probably every year for this system. But this is notable because this is the game that everyone thought was going to be the last game on the Wii. It was. There was nothing else announced after it. A lot of collectors bought this game thinking it was going to be the last game on the system and therefore it would rise in value or just be interesting to have. But they were wrong because uh, just a month after that, for Wii U, we got Rhodia the Sky Soldier. And I don't have that here. I had it in my Wii video. Rhodia the Sky Soldier is another game designed by Yuki Naka. And I won't get into it here because it, I got I went into it in the Wii U video. But what makes it interesting is it's a game that was designed for the Wii. And it was really supposed to use the Wii Nunchuck control scheme. Uh, it did not work well on the Wii U. Uh, Yuji Naka basically said when this game comes out, play the Wii version, don't play the Wii U version, use your backwards compatibility to play the Wii one. And the first print shipped with the Wii disc. So if you bought the Wii U version of Rodia the Sky Soldier, you had the Wii U disc in there and you also had the Wii disc so you could check that one out. So that was just a weird interesting note. And so that was supposed to be the last game that was released uh, for the Wii. But over a year later, in October 2016, so just months ago now, we got Just Dance 2017. I don't know, these games must be selling. Um, Ubisoft keeps pumping them out. Maybe it's just so cheap to put out another one that they don't care if it doesn't sell that well. But yeah, another Just Dance game. Nothing else to come out in the system for a year, and yet... Here's Just Dance, and I mean, I'm not even confident enough to say that this is the last game for the Wii. Who's to say that, you know, this October we won't see Just Dance 2018 come out for the Wii? Um, so as of now, that's the last game. I think it's going to stay that way, but Ubisoft could always prove me wrong. Uh, and that's it. Thanks for checking out my Wii retrospective. Uh, that's not necessarily the end of the Wii, but it is the end for a while. Um, I'm going to get into, for both Wii and Wii U at some point, I'm going to get into the WiiWare stuff, the virtual console, download titles. Um, and But for now, I'm going to go and focus on the 3DS stuff. So I'm going to keep these console retrospectives going, focusing on different machines. Subscribe if you're into that stuff. Um, and I'll see you next time. Thanks.